Do you want to hear from God this evening? Is that, is that why you're here? Part of it is to worship and to praise and, and, uh, and that's important. It's all important. It's all part of what, what uh, God has for us. And we, ter- we open his word and we say, God, speak to us. Well, I guess if you're hungry, he will. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, that's my disclaimer tonight. It's not because the preacher's naff. If, if you want to hear him, you will. Uh, I, I believe that God speaks when we've got hungry hearts to really tune in, in to him. I want to think about a particular theme this evening, and I pray that it will be relevant to you. Uh, it's going to take us an awful long time to reach the world. An awful long time, barring a move of God. It's going to take a long, long time. We have stories of the ones and twos, and I have those stories as well as I travel, of the ones and twos, people who respond to Christ. And thankfully, in some places, there are larger numbers than that. Uh, My theory is that to see revival, we have to see the birth rate into the kingdom bigger than the birth rate into the world. That's just my logic. It's not biblical, but but it's logical. There's some Irish logic there somewhere, I guess. But I, I, I just believe that there's something more that God has for us that we need to understand. And I'm trying to understand this. And so I want to talk. My theme tonight is this, confronting the king. That's my theme for tonight. So if you're taking notes, please do write down some of these scriptures. Get a hold of them. You can get the CD or the video, the DVD afterwards if you want to. But I pray that God will speak into your heart tonight, as he has to me, uh, on this whole subject that I've been studying really for quite a while now. We, we understand what it is to have a king or a queen in our nation. I was brought up in the, in the scouts, the cub scouts, and when I was a cub, I had to say this every week on a Wednesday night, I believe it was, I promise that I will do, I think you should go, Aquila, was that we had to lead, uh, do any of you remember that? Any of you have a cub scout? Aquila, cubs do your best. We'll do our best, you know, I, and I promise that I will do my best to do my duty to God and to the queen to help other people and to keep the cub scout law. Our son Isaac, Isaac's joining the army. And uh, he's, 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 that's all he wants to do. It's his thing. And, and, of course, we go to America a lot. And somebody in America said, well, you could come over here and join the American army. He says, what would I do that for? I want to serve my queen. Yeah. That's, that's his, his attitude to it. And we don't really understand the full idea of monarchy. We don't because we have our, our parliament. And in many ways, I would never call Queen Elizabeth a puppet queen. She's not because she is. It'll be a sad day when she passes on. I think she's the most wonderful leader in the world, actually. That's my personal uh, opinion. But I'm right. I think she is. And I, uh, and I think she knows the Lord. And I just think she's a wonderful leader. But, but we don't understand the full idea of monarchy, of how people serve the queen but it, or the king. But we have it in scripture. It's really important. So I want you to stay with me just for a few minutes tonight. And then I'm going to try and, and apply it to us. So that when we go out from this place, you will understand what it is to confront the king. Because there are many kings that want to take control in your life. And you have to know how to confront them. So often what we do is, and you'll find this on Facebook, we've got angry Christians who take their battle to Facebook. What the heck good does that do? All they're doing is sounding off on Facebook or on some other social media. And what it does is it just shows us that we can get angry. Whatever it is Theresa May does, or whatever it is Corbyn's like, whatever way your opinion is, you can put it on Facebook if you want, but it doesn't mean a zip to God. Just be aware of that. When we talk about the king, we've got to understand who the king is so that we know what we're fighting. So when we go out into the streets of Leeds or Bradford or whoever it is, it's not you on your own that's suddenly taking on some guy or some girl who is in a particular lifestyle. Unless your king, the king of kings, comes and backs up the words that you say, you're doing nothing. And it's the same for every one of us. We have to understand whose side we are on. And who we're fighting for and who's fighting through us. And so the whole idea of kingship in scripture is paramount in understanding what God does. He said, when his disciples came to him and they said to him, they said, listen, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, okay, I'll teach you to pray. And he made it a collective thing. He says, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He doesn't say anything there about leading people to Jesus. Now we're going to lead people to Jesus, don't get me wrong. 
What I'm saying is that when we're prioritizing what it is God has called us to do, it has to come into kingdom thinking. Because that's what Jesus was all about. And when we talk about a kingdom, we're talking about a king. Because when Jesus' kingdom is present, then Jesus is present as the king. And we know him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7, just as we start off this. What happened in the Old Testament was, right at the very beginning, God was the king. He was king with Adam, and Adam turned against God. Adam and Eve both did. When they responded the way that they did, they lost God's rulership over their life. But God wanted to be the king. And he was through the Old Testament. We have the prophets. And the prophets, really, they were God's representative. But God wanted to be the king. And so when we have in 1 Samuel chapter 7, uh, here, here is the pattern of what it should be like in our lives. I believe in 1 Samuel chapter 7, Samuel was a man, it says of him that none of his words fell to the ground. It says of Samuel, he was the most, one of the most amazing men that ever lived. He was a prophet who, can you imagine, none of his words fell to the ground. That's what God says. That means everything that he said, he was a prophet, so he spoke, everything he said happened. Or it worked out the way that that God had designed. Look at 1 Samuel 7 verse 13. Here's what should happen when God is king. So the Philistines were subdued. And they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Can you imagine if God was king? Can you imagine if in the area, which we, we've had a wonderful, wonderful testimonies tonight. If you can imagine down in Leeds and Bradford that nobody could sell drugs anymore. That it wasn't possible. They went out to try and sell them, but nobody would buy them. Why? Because Horizon was there. I'm not saying that the the access to them wasn't there. It's just nobody wanted to buy them. And so, why? Because you're there. Is that possible? Is that actually just pie in the sky? Well, not according to this passage. Because Samuel was there. The Philistines, who were the enemy that were peculiarly kept for the people of God, they weren't able to do anything. And they had to hand back to Samuel and to Israel all that they had stolen. Guys, I'm giving it all back to you. Why? I have no idea why, but I just feel I'm going to give it all back to you. Can you imagine? That is when God is the king. But look what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In my Bible it says Israel demands a king. Samuel's sons didn't walk in the way of Samuel. And so the people came to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 6. They said give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Samuel was offended. He said, they've rejected me. When they came to God, he said, they've rejected me. Verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say. To you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. Do you see that? That I should reign over them. That is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. When they came and asked for a king, God said to Samuel, They haven't rejected you. At this moment, my people have rejected me as king and lord over them. And so from that moment on, he says, let them have what they are asking for. They want a different king. Okay, it's not my plan, but let them have a different king. And so that's when God chose Saul, first of all, and then, of course, we have David. So there's a different king who is the master in, in, uh, in what's going on there in Israel. All right, are you with me so far? Now, confronting the king, that's my theme this evening, confronting the king. When things go on in our, in, in our area, we need to know what's going on. We need to know who is the king in the area where we live. When I went to Japan a number of years ago, the last Olympic Games, I was in, in Japan. And uh, I was teaching at, a, at a Christ for the Nations in Japan for a week. And a lady came in, a local pastor, and she said to me, as I was up in a place called Hokkaido, and, and uh, this, in this city... Sapporo, up in the north, the northern island, 
When I was in that, that uh, city, this lady came in and she's worked, she worked as a pastor in, with the young people, particularly in her church. She says, you know something, we have real problems here in Japan, in this part of Japan, with, uh, ch with young people and with their marriages. Marriage, if they get marriage, married, they just do not work. We're talking about Christians. Their marriages, they break down. And she said, here, there's a reason for it. When they set that city up, the Japanese government set that city up in support, political Hokkaido, when they set that city up, they sent workers up from Tokyo, and because they'd be on their own, there's an underground city and an overground city, it's a fascinating place, but when they set it up, they sent the workers up, and they also sent an army of prostitutes with them yeah. to look after them so that they wouldn't get bored. Can you believe that? That's what they did. And she has discovered that over the generations that that has happened is that now there's something that is in control in that area that works in the lives of these young people who come to get married. And they don't know how to treat women, the young guys. The girls don't know how to treat the men. They don't know how to. And so their marriages break down. And she was saying, listen, we've had to confront the strong man who is controlling our young people in this area. Jesus said, listen, if you want to take a goods from a house, you first have to bind the strong man. When you bind the strong man, you can take his goods. You can fiddle around praying for the rest of your life, but if you don't identify who the strong man is in the area where you're working and you don't take on the king of that area, it doesn't matter what you do. You can, can have church, you can have meetings, you can do what you want, but you need to understand who the king is because there will only be one king and our king is Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not you they're rejecting, but me in asking for a king. Are you with me this evening so far? A couple of examples I want to give. Turn on to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And the question I want to ask you is this this evening. What voices are shouting loudest in your life? What are the voices that shout in your life? For some people, when, when somebody is hooked on drugs, the, the biggest voice that comes is, I need a fix, I need a fix, go get a fix. Doesn't matter what I do, I've got to get it, I've got to answer that. Doesn't matter who I hurt, I've got to answer that call. What are the voices that are shouting in your life? For some people, it's their self-image, it's their Facebook that they've got to get onto, or Instagram to find out how many likes there are. I, my, my self-worth and identity is, is through what I see reflected to me on my phone or on my screen. What are the voices? I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm, I'm not intelligent enough, nobody loves me, uh, I've got to do this to be accepted. Uh, what are the voices on the internet that shouts at us from pornography, what are the voices that shout into our life? And this, this uh, passage in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there are voices, and the voices come from a man called Goliath, who is a Philistine, who is a very big Philistine. He's a young a man, not, not as young as, as David was, because Saul said he'd been a fighting man since his youth. So he wasn't a youth anymore, but he wasn't an old man, but he's a very strong man, a very tall, a very tough guy, but he had a very good voice. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 17, look at what happens. You know this story. I'm sure you know the story backing up to this. God had chosen David through Samuel to replace Saul uh, because he was a man after his own heart. David was a man who, a young boy or young man who looked after sheep. And God called him from the sheepfold. And then his brothers, his three eldest brothers who were over the age of 20, that's why they were in the army. You've got Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. They were there with the, the army of Israel facing the Philistines. And so every morning when they got up from their beds, from their camp, from their tents, they walked out and they faced the Philistines. And the Philistines faced them. And the Philistines were some of the most fierce fighters on the face of the earth. But every day what, what's happened is, look in verse 4 of 1 Samuel 17, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And then it tells us all the things about his armor that I don't want to look at tonight. But look at verse 8. He stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. Which Kathy pointed out to me was a total lie because when he was beaten, they didn't become their servants. The enemy won't do deals with you and tell you the truth. 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight against him. Now look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. There's not been a fight yet. There hasn't been a fight. Fear does not need a fight. He you listen to me? Fear does not need a fight. Fear is the result of not fighting. Fear does not need any fight. Fear is when we listen to the shouts that are shouting loudest in our lives. That's what fear comes from. Fear is meditating on all the things that could possibly go wrong. Because we think it will go wrong. You see, if you were to ask the Philistine, do you believe you'll win this battle? No. Do you believe Goliath's stronger than you? Yes. Do you believe that the enemy will prevail? Yes. And when we see around our nation, we see what's happening, a lot of Christians would say amen to that. Well, the world's getting worse, isn't it? Don't say amen. Amen means so be it. And so we, we sort of agree with what the enemy is doing. And yet I believe God wants to pour out his spirit in an unprecedented way on this nation of ours. So that we PC people swept into the kingdom. But I don't believe it's going to come in the one by one. It's going to come when we take authority over the enemy or the king who thinks he's in control of this land. So here we have Goliath who shouts his head off, I defy you, send me a man. But they wouldn't send a man. And then David comes along and he happens to come just as the guy is speaking. And he asks his questions, of course. And it's no, it's no coincidence that he arrived just at that moment. Verse 24 is the same as verse 11. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. They were dreadfully afraid. And I think today, sometimes the church is dreadfully afraid. And so for me, the author what's happening here is it's, it's a battle for authority. And Saul even recognizes it. I used to think the next chapter was very hard to understand. Because in the next chapter, do you remember when David kills Goliath? He's on his way back. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 18, and the women on the street start singing a song. And the song they, they sing, I thought it was way over the top. What, or at least Saul took it as way, way over the top in his response. He said, listen, the, the women are singing, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul said, what more can he want but the kingdom? That's exactly what David wanted, but not for himself, as Saul did. Saul wanted the kingdom for himself. David wanted the kingdom to restore God's order so that God would be seen as the king. That's why when he faced Goliath, when he went to Saul and said, I'll fight him, Saul, he said, you can't fight him, you're just, just a boy. Listen, I'll fight him. I fought the lion. I fought the bear when they came to take my, my sheep. They had no right, they had no legal right to take my, my sheep, my father's flocks. They had no legal right. So of course I'm going to call those, that bear out. I'm going to call that lion out for who he was. And the same God who gave me the, the ability to take out the lion and to take out the bear will give me the ability to take out this uncircumcised Philistine. See, all the, the rest of the army, they saw a man coming to fight him. David saw an uncircumcised Philistine. And he's not talking about his loincloth. He didn't see a flash of what was there. What he's saying basically is this. This man has no legal authority to speak in the way he's speaking. He's got no right to do that. He's defying the armies of the living God. I'm going to take him out. Why? Because he thinks he's the king. That's what he stood for. He said, listen, if you guys defeat me, you'll be the king. If I defeat you, I'll be the king. This was a battle for authority. And David recognized it as such. And that's why he came and says, no, God is the king. I will take this man out and I will destroy him right this moment. Just you watch. And he did it. It was a battle for authority. See, we need to know who he is 
in our ministries if we're going to confront the king. I look through some scriptures here. Luke 4 verse 6. Jesus said, or This is actually what the enemy said to Jesus when he wanted him to bow down. He says, all this authority I will give you. You see, there was an element of truth in that. The devil was given some authority. But Jesus won it back on the cross. It says, you know, he descended into hell and he took the keys of death and hell. That, so Jesus took authority and he has all authority. Matthew 16, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What does that mean? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's not our persuasive talking. That's using the authority God has given you. Mark 3, 27, I've already quoted it. No one can enter a strong man's house and plum, plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Luke 10, 19, behold, I send out the 70. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 4, verse 31, Jesus goes into church. He goes into the synagogue. And he cast out an unclean spirit. Why? He was speaking with authority. He had authority. And Jesus said in John 20, 21, Peace to you as the Father has sent me. That's the same way that I send you. Now turn with me. To, I've got two examples here this evening. Turn with me to the second book of Kings and chapter 1. I read this recently and I just saw something in it. You might never have looked at this passage in your life. It's about King Ahaziah. And if I asked you without opening your Bible, who's King Ahaziah, you might not have a clue. Maybe you know more than I do, maybe you did, but I doubt it. 2 Kings chapter 1, it's an interesting story. Let me, can I read a bit of it with you? It'll sort of preach as I read it, if that's all right. So just if you've got your Bible, follow it. 2 Kings chapter 1, it's about Ahaziah who fell through his, the, his roof and he became, he became crippled. And it looked like he, was, he wasn't going to recover. And so he said to his men, go and consult Baal, Baal, the evil god. Find out if I will recover. It's in 2 Kings chapter 1. But verse 3, but an angel, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there's no god in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub the God of Ekron, Beelzebub's Lord of the Flies. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. This passage is all about authority. When the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back? So they said to him, a man came to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there's no God in Israel? You're sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he said to them, this is the king, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. He said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Now this, note this next bit, verse 9. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him and there he was, this is Elijah, sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. This is authority. This, you see, it, it, the king had lost his authority. This is the king trying to exercise his authority. Elijah is the man of God. He's sitting on a hill. They come up and this is what the first man said. Man of God. The king has said, come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. A fire bolt came out, burned him up. Do you like this story? <laughs> then the king, verse 11, sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he answered and said to him, man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. The king has said, you see that? He's quoting the king. He said, I've got authority. That's the, the captain basically saying, we've got authority here over you. Elijah says, you think so? Come down quickly. So Elijah said to them, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him, him and his 50. That's a hundred charcoal men at the bottom of the hill. Right? Zipped completely. Verse 13, again he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men. And the third captain, he was a wise man, 
of 50 went up and came, fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said, doesn't mention the king, pleaded with him, said to him, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. He's recognized authority. I'm not even going to quote the king. I've come to you, and the king has sent me, but I'm not even going to mention his name. But I recognize here, sitting on that hill, you have got authority from God. So please, please, respect the life of me and my 50 men. Look, fires come down from heaven, burned up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s. But let my life now be precious in your sight. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. And then he said to him, to the king. The king doesn't say another word here. You read through this passage, the king doesn't utter another word. Thus says the Lord, because you've sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Do you see that? A passage that's all about authority. We need to know who we are. We need to know who God is. We need to know who we are. And so I'm imploring you this evening that in your ministry, wherever it is God has placed you, whether it's with your family with your friends, with your ministry here in England, in the UK, or abroad. We have to understand that there is a battle for authority. Yeah. Yes. And sometimes there are voices that shout into our lives. You'll get them, those of you working with people in a pastoral issue. You'll have people telling you what to do all the time. Everybody knows better than you do, or they think they do. And we'll, all sorts of voices will come your direction, telling what telling you what you should do. We need to understand where authority comes from. Authority comes from the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our prayer is, Lord, let your kingdom come. Because when his kingdom comes in your village, in your town, then one of the results of that is that I believe people will come to Christ. Because the priority is the kingdom and the priority is binding the strong man. You'll find it with Jesus. If you want to look, you can examine this yourself. The first man that, that I started to, a friend of mine who, who shared this, that started me on this journey. I was at a meeting with him last year and he, he started off a breakfast meeting. And he got, got my gander straight away when he started off. He says, we're not here to lead people to Jesus. I said, what? You're not here? I've been working as an evangelist. Of course we're here to lead people to Jesus. I said, well, that's what I do. So no, he says, that's not what we're here for. We're here to preach the kingdom. Yeah. We're here to bring God's kingdom. Now, the result of that is well, people will come to Christ. He told, us, he told me this story of when he went to a church. He was, uh, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what denomination he was in, but he was sent into churches to sort out issues. And he went to this particular church that couldn't keep their pastor. They tried, they just couldn't. They had a pastor after pastor that stayed a few months and they needed some. So he was sent in to this place. So he went in to work in this church just for a period of time and then to establish a new man or woman, whoever was going to be in that place. And when he went there, he, he, um, God started to reveal something to him. And what had happened in this church, this is a true story. My details will not be true. I remember it the way he said it to me, but the, the, the essence of it is true. Is that in this church, there were, were um, more women than there were men. And so the women wanted to see their husbands get saved and come to know the Lord. So they started a sort of a supper on a Friday evening. One of the Friday evenings, one of the guys threw his keys on the table and to see if anybody would recognize them. They all have their own cars in America, I guess, a prosperous place. Anyway, cut a long story short, after a number of weeks, as they were messing about with keys, some guy said, well, whoever identifies these keys, go home with the guy who owns the car. And so they ended up swapping wives in this particular church. And it went on for, a, you wouldn't believe it, but this is, this is what he said happened in that place. So nothing could happen. There was a spirit of adultery 
that took over the church. So there was no worship, there was no move of God, there was nothing would happen in that place. But God revealed it to this fellow. He started to show, made his inquiries, and so he confronted the king that was trying to rule the church. And when he confronted the king and took authority over the king, suddenly blessings started to move. And people started to come to Christ. Then they, they put a, a, a man in there. But he said he could have done what he wanted to do. He could have just done his normal hymn sandwich or whatever it was that they did in that particular denomination. But nothing would have happened. So what I'm saying is that we have to understand in the areas where we are. That's why a church can't just do it in another church. Alpha Course is a great, it's the greatest evangelistic tool. But I see everybody copying everybody else and doing it. That's okay if it works for you, great. I think it's the best one that we have. But I notice that churches sort of look at what works in another area and copy that but you can't copy Catholic Church because where you live is totally unique that happened you you need to know what goes on in the area what went on in the area where you live so that we can confront the strong man and then we can steal his goods see I believe that the, the day will come when we'll see I really believe this we'll see whole nations come to Christ I really believe that. I, I believe we'll see the day when tens of thousands will come to Christ at the one time. Not just in, in the Reiner Bonnke uh, rallies. I believe in the future there may not be well-known names involved in any of this. Because we'll understand our kingdom authority that we have as children of the king. You are a child of the king this evening. You are a redeemed, blood-bought child of the king. That means you're different. That means you're seated in heavenly places with him. That means that, that you have a authority that nobody else in the world has you've been given that authority by Jesus and we have to understand as David did David was crazy because he when he went along the people his brothers everybody tried to talk him out of it but he said you don't understand guys what's wrong with you he's an uncircumcised Philistine he has no authority to think he can be the king he cannot be the king doesn't anybody understand this and nobody understood that and so they were afraid because they listened to the loudest voice that was shouting into their lives. Let me tell you, the loudest voice shouting into David's life. You can read it through the Psalms. You'll understand when you read through the Psalms, the word of God. Jesus, uh, David panted for God's presence. He panted for his word. His word was more important to him than anything, than honey, than anything sweet. It was the word of God. So when David came to face Goliath, the loudest voice shouting to him wasn't the voice of Goliath thinking, I'm going to make mincemeat of you. No, the loudest voice was the word of God that told him who he was. See, he was told, the Bible says that he took him from the sheepfold that's what the scriptures say. David, God said that when speaking to David, I took you from, this is when Nathan said you can build the temple in Chronicles. But he said you won't build the temple, it'll be, it'll be your son Solomon after you. But he says, I took you from the sheepfold. I called you to be a commander of the people. A commander of the people. So David knew at the sheepfolds, this isn't later on, this is at the sheepfold, looking after the sheep. God had shown him that he was a commander of the peoples. Now ask me, let me ask you, who are you this evening? It all depends. You can only answer that by answering the question, what are the loudest voices you're listening to? If it's your great Auntie Maud who tells you you're an idiot, well then, then if you're listening to that, saying amen to that, well then that is the one who controls you. It's up to you. It's up to me. Nobody can make you do what you do. Nobody can tell you who you are unless you allow those voices to be the mainstay in your life. And I know tonight that your choice will be, I want the word of God to be the loudest voice coming into my life because if the word of God is the loudest voice coming into our lives then there's nothing you cannot do even if you're in chains for Christ in Philippians Paul said in the same letter I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me why because the word of God was living through him and pouring through him so what voices are loudest in your life this evening because those voices will take you to places that you might not want to go 
the voice of the doctor might be taking you to a place you do not want to go. Is that the loudest voice shouting into your life? I know it is for some. I know when people say, I'd love to come on a missionary trip with you, but the doctor says I can't. And the loudest voice is the doctor. Well, I cannot argue with the loudest voice if the doctor says something, that's fine. Now, I love my brother-in-law as a doctor. I love the medical profession. I'm just using that as an example. Or the loudest voice is, I can't afford to do anything. I can't afford to go here. I can't afford to go there. I always say to people, 90% of folk who want to travel with me don't go with me because they don't believe God can answer or can meet their needs. They don't believe that he can provide the ticket for them to go. And so before they even get to applying or wanting to come with me, they've already lost because the voices they've lived to says, you can't afford to do this. You can't afford this. What about your health? What if you take ill? Look at you, look at you. You can't do this. And so those voices, they control us so much. And we normally say amen to them. Well, I'm wanting you to get a bit more aggressive this evening. You were aggressive in your praise. And that's wonderful to be aggressive and to dance and have joy before the Lord. I'm just wanting to take you to a slightly different direction so that aggression will understand that we have an enemy who seeks to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. And the way he writes that verse is that the first bit is, is minimalistic compared to the second bit. He's saying, okay, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But let me tell you something far greater, far, far more powerful. I have come that you might have life and have it in all its abundance. And that needs to be the strongest voice that is shouting into our lives. Because if that's the voice we're listening to, then there's nothing you cannot do. You can do whatever it is God has placed on your heart to do. So I want to encourage you this evening that you seek the Lord. And you ask him what he is doing. And he will reveal himself. And he will reveal himself to you. I'm going to come to a conclusion there, another one, but I'm not going to go into it. I want to just come to a sort of conclusion there because I believe we need to take some authority this evening in our lives and you need to take some authority in your life this evening. No one can tell you how to live. Even as a Christian, no one can tell you how to live. No one can tell me how to live. I'm my own boss. I decide what I do and I decide how to do it. That's just the way it is. But you're exactly the same. Unless you've been so entwined in, in, in other people and answering to what they have told you to, to be. That you've been squeezed. J.B. Phillips in that Romans 12, he talked about don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. But actually I found it's not the world wants to squeeze you, it's the church wants to squeeze you. The world's not bothered about, the world doesn't give a rip about you. It's not interested. But the church does sometimes to make you the way it wants you to be. But some of you are odd people. You are. I mean, Hollybush has always been odd. <laughs> but some of you are odd people. Now listen, that's a compliment coming from me, by the way. That was, that's not a criticism. That's a compliment. That's not a criticism. Just normal, I often said this, normal is overrated. Normal is, is not something you want to be. I've often said to people, do you really want on your tombstone or someone to write on, your, write on your, your stone, he was a nice man. I mean, do you really, you really want that? I mean, that is so naff. He was a nice man. He was, is that really what you want? You know, don't you want to be a bit more dangerous <clears throat> than that? Don't you want to, to kick some devil's butts out of the place? I mean, is there not something in you that wants to really take hold of the enemy and say, listen, we look around us, you look around, and I've, I work, I'll be in, the, I'll, this time next week, I'm going to the Ivory Coast on Monday, and uh, the church I work with, <clears throat> a lady came and prophesied years ago about how uh, it's, it's built on the prostitutes. Basically, it's, it's, the church is built on prostitutes, and uh, they don't call them prostitutes, they're, they're ladies, uh, and they give them dignity, uh, I watched, well, anyway, we, we, um, the, the church brings them in and, and gets them redeemed and, and they get a little business and maybe get some food and cook, cook it. But so I've seen some wonderful stories of, of ladies in, in the Ivory Coast who were prostitutes. But God has given them a, a tremendous power. 
and a tremendous, you know, totally restored their lives, but put them in a different place than where they are. God didn't redeem you. You're not just a redeemed version of the old man. There's got to be more danger than where, you know, there's got to be more danger. We went to Beamish Museum today, and I was chatting to one of the guys who had a machine gun. And the machine gun from 1915, I couldn't believe this. It's a, I don't know what it was called, but I was fascinated. 200 rounds a minute. 200 rounds a minute. I mean, that's in 1915. First World War, the same machine gun was used right up until 1967, he said. It was right through the Second World War. That was an incredible weapon. Whoever, six men to control it, one guy to fire, three to carry it. I don't know what the other two were doing, but they're doing doing something with this gun but dangerous and the the, the British army and their in, in their to their brigades only had two of them the Germans had something like eight but th this this weapon that somebody invented it in 1915 that lasted through to 67 I couldn't believe so what you mean nobody invented something better in all that time you don't need anything better it's 200 rounds a minute that's doing all right wow that's incredible but what, what it made me think of the danger the danger man you know the the the, the church in Britain is a pussy-footed naff thing that doesn't do danger danger mouse anything I mean what is what are we no that's not right I shouldn't say that forgive me listen you are an odd person tonight and you make up your mind if you want to be an odd person because odd people actually make changes people who conform don't it's only odd people that make changes in the world because conformity we conform to everything around because it's easier to do that we teach our kids of course we do how to wash their hands how to have manners how to say thank you and we conform them to the way that they're expected to live and that's a good thing but in the church we do a similar thing we conform people to expect this result I really believe there's something dangerous about us I was thinking as we we're worshiping at the beginning tonight I've been thinking over this last couple of days about uh, the thin places that there were in scripture you know the thin places and some people would call it I was talking to a guy from Pakistan last night uh, about portals and about uh, places where where God has been very close and Hollybush has always been a place like that right from 50 years 50 years when people have had angelic visitations in this place well you know if, if an angel I, I don't suppose the angel was lost I don't think you know you don't get lost around North Allerton I I think it was a designed thing so you know, what I'm saying is is what I'm saying is that actually there was something at that time where this was a thin place the Celts talked about a thin place and a thin place was, you know when Jacob was asleep at night, that's one of the thin places in scripture, where he said, he woke up in the morning, he said, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize I was in the house of God, the very presence of God. Remember, you know, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, Andrew Crouch wrote. You know, so there was a thin place. Hollybush has always been a thin place. A place where people have come here, and it's been unusual. They've met God in an unusual way in this place. Now, there's no reason to believe that that would change. There's no reason to believe that God did that once and then said, well, actually, now I've cemented over that thin place and I'm going to find another thin place. This could still be a thin place for you. And tonight, for, for us here, you know, this, it's a simple message, but it's an important message. And when I signed up for God years ago, when I walked out of of the Methodist ministry many years ago not because of Methodism I love Methodism by the way but when I walked out of, of going for the ministry way back in I don't know was in 1980 something I said to God I said God I don't want to conform to what people expect and it's so easy to do I, I want it to be uh, hitting the mark so that what I do and what other people do in the meetings that I'm in, and thank God this year has been the most incredible year of my life, this year. I've never had a year quite like this year. I've walked into places, and it's almost like God has just uh, said, right, now speak. And God has, has spoken to people, and change has taken place. And so this evening, I'm praying for you that here in this place, we can have the worship, we can have that... But actually, God wants to make you dangerous again. Come on. Yes, come on. He wants to make you dangerous again. I'm not saying you're wrong in what you're doing. I'm not saying anybody in this place is wrong in what they're doing. I'm just saying I believe God wants to just make you dangerous again. 
and maybe add in something that, that perhaps has been lost. Something of this kingdom thinking whereby you recognize, hey, I'm a child of God. I, I don't have to live at this level. I don't have to have the world dictating to me. I don't have to have anybody dictating to me the way I live or the way I do things. I'm not meaning to make you uh, uh, arrogant or to make you uh, what is unsubmissive. I'm, I'm, that isn't what I'm saying. It isn't before people. I don't care about people. It's not people I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about the spiritual realm that you live in. When you walk in a spiritual realm, there's a, a different criteria. It's not, it's not, when we think what's happening in America, people go on Facebook and they talked about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and it became such a, a level. God was doing something far deeper than that. As he is here with our, all that's happening with Brexit and all that, it's not just, there's something more happening. We've got to realize that. There's a battle going on in, in the heavenlies. There's, there are issues that are happening that sometimes we don't realize about when we're just driven drifting through our worship or drifting through our, our world. There's a, a, a deeper level that God wants to take us to where we start to understand that we've got weapons that are great. And it's not against people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. And if I were to ask you tonight, how long has it been since you took on a principality or a power, you might say to me, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. And that's what I'm going to tonight. That's what I mean. We need to understand that there are levels of authority that God gives us, whereby we have to take the enemy on where he is in our lives. Then I believe, then I believe when we do that, then when we go out on the streets, suddenly the girls are there. Wow, they're all here tonight. Isn't it fantastic? What a coincidence. No, it's no coincidence because you've taken authority over the strong man who held those lives. It's the strong man you're fighting. It's not alcohol or drugs. You're not fighting those things. You're fighting the strong man who is using those tools, sure. But he's the one you're fighting. And when you take authority and silence him, then there's a release that comes where people are free to respond to the gospel. So all I'm asking to do is to go a little bit deeper, go a little bit higher, if you see it as that. Some of you might think, what's that guy on tonight? That's fine, honestly. It's, it's fine. I don't mind. But I believe there are some of you who God has actually put a deeper anointing on to go a bit deeper and to start taking the enemy out where he is. Shall we stand together? Let's stand and pray. I have no idea how long I've preached for, but there you go. Now, if God has spoken to you tonight, it won't be for everybody. I wonder, would you like to come and just stand at the front before I pray? If God has spoken to you, we don't need an emotional alarm of God, I come or anything. Just if God has spoken to you, I want to just declare this over your life tonight. If he has, and, and we're just going to de declare that God is putting you on a higher level. That's fine. I don't mind who comes, who doesn't come. I just want to ask. All I, it's not important that you come. That, that isn't, it isn't for me. It's not about me. Uh, it's not about me at all. When I preach, it's not about me. It's about you. So it doesn't matter to me whether somebody comes or not. It's not the walking to the front that does it. All it, all it does is it, it makes you move where you say, right, I'm into this. That's all responding does. And uh, we can just say, God, you know, you're, we're, we're taking a step towards you. God, you've seen the hearts of people here tonight taking a step towards you. You've seen that. Lord, when we look through the scripture, and we, we've just studied it tonight, a small bit of it about the kingdom. We want to be kingdom people. And Lord, we want to see this great nation of Great Britain, this great, great nation. We want to see uh, England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland and the whole Ireland, island of Ireland. We want to see these nations come to know you. We want to see Europe come to know you. God, this place, Lord, we want to remind you that this is the place that you spoke, what you sent missionaries out of way back in the, the late 1800s, early, uh, the late 19th century. God, I thank you for the, the modern missionary movement, the students' missionary movement, the movements that came from Britain. Thank you, Lord, for those from Cambridge, those from Wales, the Welsh Revival. Thank you, Lord, those who came from Scotland. Father, those that came out of Ireland. Thank you, Lord, for those Christians that came with the Celts. Thank you for St. Patrick. Thank you, Lord, for, for the people who came to these shores with the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for every Christian you've sent who stood up, Lord, in this place. But, Lord, we're here tonight. And, God, we're just standing here in your presence. And, Lord, we want to acknowledge you that Jesus is King. 
Jesus. Maybe you, you, maybe you don't know Jesus tonight. Listen, this can, you don't have to repeat a certain prayer. Just acknowledge him as king tonight and ask him into your life. Ask him to cleanse you from your sin. He'll do that tonight, just standing here. Just you do that. We acknowledge you as king tonight, king of our lives. We submit to you, to your lordship. And God, we want to say to you, we don't want to be king ourselves. We want to see Jesus as the king. You are the life giver. You are the one who said the enemy seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life. And Lord, we are life people tonight. And so, Father, we stand for life. We stand for the kingdom of God. Lord, as we stand up on this tonight, just on this floor here in this church, devil, we want to say to you that you are a liar. You are a thief. You steal, but no longer. We come and we stand on this holy ground and we take authority over you and say, no longer do you have any role in my life. No longer will I listen to your voices. No longer will I listen to your orders or to your commands. But I recognize you tonight for who you are, a thief. And you have no legal authority. You are an uncircumcised Philistine. And so this day, we cut off your head in Jesus' name. And we declare the kingship of Jesus. And so, Lord, we submit to you tonight. We say that you have full authority in our lives to do what you want in each one of our lives. And so, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and would you speak to each one of us that as we go from this place, teach us, Lord, what the, the spiritual things that are trying to control Leeds and Bradford and North Allerton and, and Thirsk or, or Buckinghamshire or, or wherever it is in, up in County Durham. Lord, speak to us. Pull back the curtain so that we can recognize the enemy for who he is. And Lord, then we will bind the strong man and we will loose the power of God. You said what we bind on earth will be loosed on heaven. We'll be, we'll be bound in heaven. What we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so, Father, we take authority tonight and we say, Lord Jesus. Just raise your hands to him and just say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord, I, I commission this group of odd people tonight. I commission this group of dangerous people tonight. Just like that machine gun I saw today. Lord, I pray, God, that you will set off a machine gun inside each one of these people, men and women tonight, that God, some of, I pray some of them, Lord, will not sleep tonight properly, but through the night you will minister to them and download. God, I pray you'll download your word in a way they've never seen before. I pray, Lord, you'll give revelation after revelation. But Lord, most of all, let them understand who the strong man is. And Lord, I pray they will take authority and that, God, they will see results like they've never seen before. Lord, I pray for those prostitutes, Lord, those women of the street, particularly in Bradford and Leeds. God, we bind the strong man. Devil, we bind you in Jesus' name. You need to get out of that place because you have no legal authority. You are an uncircumcised Philistine. We command you to take your hands off those streets. We pray, Lord, you will cause those pimps to just leave in Jesus' name. And Lord, we declare, we loose your power through that team in Jesus' name. That as they go out each night down onto those streets, that Lord, they will lead girl after girl after girl. Easy. Lord, let it be easy for them because the strong man has been bound. God, teach us, please. We are your children tonight. And we pray, Lord, teach us, I pray, to understand where we are. Just like Daniel, I said, there's, in the heavens, there's a battle going on that we know nothing of. Lord, would you pull back the curtain and let us just see. So that, Father, we will say the words you're saying. We will fight the enemy you're fighting. And we will see the victory that you will enjoy. That you've already said on the cross, it's finished. So we declare, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done in each of our lives this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Jim, come and take over for me because I don't want to start again. The Lord bless you. Go home and do some damage. 
Amen. Hallelujah. We're in a battle. Yeah. I just want to say this. I've mentioned it to our people just a few days ago. It isn't often this happens, friends, but if you read the newspapers, you find out that there are many opportunities. But you've got to know your enemy. You've got to know your God. <laughs> and so, five weeks ago now, in the Northern Echo, one of our local papers, on the Wednesday of that week, and there was a oh, photo of that size and an invitation I've never seen before in my life to go to this place the following Wednesday. So people were given a week's notice and it was to be open for anybody to come and have a look from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock. Three people went. One person was there about five past seven. Another person was there about ten past seven. Another person turned up at eight p.m. Where was it? I went to the enemy's camp in Nathalton. It was open. To have a look round at the Freemasons Lodge. There was eight or ten men there belonging to the lodge. Three ladies, cheer up folks, <laughs> cups of tea, etc. You see, we've got to be dangerous at times. And it's no good preaching about a thing, nothing about what you've said tonight, brother, but it's no good if you don't know your enemy, if you know your enemy and you don't go for him. You can stay on the, the other mountainside. I'm not boasting in that. I was one of those three. Shame. I, I did mention around. To my, Arthur and Ernest would have gone with me. I said, no, I just want to I, I go. I'm not going on, I'm going on my own with the Lord. And I learned a lot more. But I want to say this, friends. There's been repercussions from that. Hallelujah. And the battle is on the inside. Not out there. It's not fisticuffs. That don't do anything. But, hey friends, it's Kingsley, thanks for tonight. Simple. Everything you've said. Scriptural, right? But, hey, if we don't go towards Goliath... We'll lose the battle. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. We've got to go towards Goliath. We've got to have our armor on. And if you notice, one man was mightily armed. And David's brothers were mightily armed. Here's David, no, maybe a sheepskin around him. And a sling. But he knew how to use the sling. Right. <laughs> and he had a God on his side. So what I'm saying to each one of us, every age group... Some of us are getting a bit older, but hey, come on. Young men, young women, into the army. Volunteers! Mm. Not conscripts, volunteers. I chop the head off at the end of it as well. Amen. Yeah. That was, yeah, just to make sure. Yes. <laughs> so, hey, be dangerous. The enemy's dangerous. And the devil's dangerous. He has people doing dangerous things. But come on, friends. We're into 2018, right? Be bold, be strong. Amen. Go. Get into the battle. Yeah, you'll be hurt. You'll be misunderstood. But hey, that's where the battle's strong, but that's where Jesus is. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he brought us in, not to stay in, he brought us in to go out there. So, hey. Let's give a glory shout, David. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, David. Come on, David. Come on. You can do this. You make the noise. Come on. <laughs> yes. Come on. One, two, three. 
Hallelujah! Well, that, that was fairly good. One, two, three. Hallelujah! And one, and one more time. Hallelujah! Amen. Let's Glory. Keep, let's keep praising God. Yeah. Amen. Bless you.